To make peace, scientists built the ultimate weapon of war. To fight fascism, they unleashed the power of the atom. Theoretical brilliance and engineering grit gave birth to an ethical nightmare, the atom bomb. Now, the Manhattan Project on Modern Marvels. At 5.30 a.m. July 16, 1945, scientists and dignitaries awaited the detonation of the first atomic bomb in a desolate area of the New Mexico desert, known aptly as Jornada del Muerto, or Journey of Death. They had taken bets on how much power their creation might unleash, but many wondered whether the weapon would work at all. There was, however, one certainty. If the atomic bomb detonated, the world would never be the same. This story is the great tragic epic of the 20th century. If I were going to give it a theme, the theme would be humankind invents the means of its own destruction. And in order to do so, scientists, engineers, and the army teamed up in an effort dubbed the Manhattan Project. In the short span of two years, they built an industrial complex with sites across the country that would rival the size of the automotive industry. To manufacture fuel for the bomb, they built the fifth largest town in the state of Tennessee that consumed one-tenth of the electrical power generated in the United States. The bomb builders spent well over $2 billion, almost $30 billion in today's market, to detonate the first man-made atomic explosion just 28 months after scientists set foot in a lab at the Manhattan Project's Los Alamos, New Mexico facility. Nonetheless, that July morning in 1945, many of the world's top physicists watched anxiously at the test site 200 miles south of Los Alamos, awaiting the results of their labors. Five, four, three, two, but this one. countdown had really begun 12 years before, when many of these scientists escaped the coming of fascism to Europe. Once uh, Hitler took power in 1933, the Jews of Europe, especially the Jews of Germany, were under a direct threat. And uh, some of the best scientists in the country happened to be Jewish. Hans Bethe was one, Edward Teller was one, Leo Szilard was one, Einstein was one. And one by one, they fled Europe to the United States. Scientists found refuge at American universities. In 1938, dramatic news arrived from Germany. German scientists had split the atom by bombarding uranium with neutrons, which caused instability in the uranium nucleus. During this split, mass was lost and was converted into kinetic energy. They had discovered fission, and with it, opened a Pandora's box. If each of those neutrons goes into another uranium nucleus and causes fission, then the first fission has led to more than two fissions in the next generation. And you can see that each successive generation has many more neutrons, and this causes an explosive chain reaction. If two masses of highly fissionable uranium in the form of a sphere and a plug could be brought together with sufficient speed inside a bomb, an exponentially increasing chain reaction with explosive force would result. The implications of the discovery of the fission of uranium would be obvious to scientists in Nazi Germany, and this frightened Leo Szilard, a 40-year-old emigre physicist from Hungary. Politically astute, Szilard wanted to warn President Roosevelt, but knew that he lacked the stature to do so. Imagine men with heavy foreign accents say they have figured out a way to make a bomb no bigger than an ordinary bomb that could blow up a city. Uh, you might well think they were crackpots and throw them out of your office. Szilard wrote a letter to the president and sought a prominent ally to sign it, Albert Einstein. Szilard, who didn't drive a car, enlisted the help of his friend Edward Teller, an eminent theoretical physicist 
to drive him to Einstein's summer house on Long Island. Einstein read what Lord Hibbert Szilard has written, asked a few questions about it, and then said yes, yes, and signed it. On October 11, 1939, in response to Einstein and Szilard's letter of warning, President Roosevelt formed the Advisory Committee on Uranium. But this abstract new discovery became a low priority for a leadership distracted by a world war that was now two months old. A recent refugee of that war, 37-year-old physicist Enrico Fermi, narrowly escaped with his Jewish wife, Laura. They used the opportunity of going to Sweden to collect the Nobel Prize to take to go from there and then go on to the United States so that the um, fascist authorities in Italy at that time didn't know that they were actually not going to be returning to Italy. Together with Leo Szilard at Colombia, Fermi tackled the first obstacle to the bomb, the question of whether or not a sustained chain reaction could be induced in a uranium reactor. Without the successively doubling power of the chain reaction, a bomb would be an impossibility. Fermi was one of the few scientists who was talented both in theory and in practice. He loved getting his hands dirty. Leo Szilard was the antithesis of Enrico Fermi. Szilard usually slept late. He soaked in the bathtub to get fresh ideas. While in the bathtub, Szilard remained focused on the competition, the German bomb effort. He convinced scientists in the US whose community thrived on openness to censor their own papers so that they would not inadvertently help the Germans. As the US bomb effort was taking its first tentative steps, news that the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin had begun actively pursuing uranium research rippled through the American scientific community. It would take nothing short of a disaster to move the president to take decisive action. And a disaster was not far off. Prior to 1933, Germany produced the most Nobel laureate scientists. After that date, scientists in the United States received the most honors. The Manhattan Project will return on Modern Marvels. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, sinking 19 U.S. naval vessels and killing more than 2,000 soldiers. No matter how long it may take us. The next day, the U.S. declared war on Japan. World War II was no longer just America Europe's war. And their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. America's entry into the war had a galvanizing effect on its moribund atomic bomb effort. President Roosevelt approved production of the weapon and turned the nuclear program over to the Army. Brigadier General Leslie R. Groves, an expert engineer and administrator, was placed at the head of the Manhattan Engineer District named after the project's initial headquarters in New York City. General Groves, having just finished building the Pentagon, was absolutely disgusted to be assigned the Manhattan Project, as it came to be called. He was sure it was a boondoggle. He was sure you could never do such a thing. But at the University of Chicago, Zillard and Fermi were taking the first steps in proving Groves wrong. They were trying to demonstrate that the fission process could be harnessed by launching a sustained chain reaction in uranium. They built the first primitive reactor in a squash court beneath the stands of the university's football stadium. The reactor consisted of a pile in which a fission reaction could be initiated and controlled. They did it by piling layers of graphite and then embedding balls of uranium so that when the neutrons started flying through, they would be slowed by the graphite collide with the uranium, release more neutrons, and those neutrons would continue in the chain reaction pattern. This momentous achievement, only detectable by a Geiger counter, meant that the fission process could be sustained. Nuclear energy could be released in a controlled way, as in a reactor, or perhaps cataclysmically, as in a bomb. It was so crazy that you could put a bunch of uranium together with graphite, and the thing would spring to life. The bomb effort went into high gear. 
Its first priority was the lack of weapons-grade fuel. Fission is more readily produced in a rare uranium isotope, uranium-235, that occurs naturally at a ratio of 1 to 139 to its less useful twin, uranium-238. Chemically identical, the isotopes were almost impossible to separate. The only workable method in 1942 was electromagnetic separation. In this process, a mass spectrometer used for separating electrically charged particles according to their mass sent a stream of uranium atoms past a magnet. Atoms of the lighter isotope U-235 would be deflected more than those of the heavier U-238 and would be captured one atom at a time. Scientists at Columbia University championed a competing mode of separation, gaseous diffusion. This method passed the isotope through a porous barrier that separated the lighter isotope from its heavier counterpart, but it proved to be technically challenging. In a uh, square centimeter, about the size of a thumbnail, you've got to have hundreds of millions of pores, and they have to all be the same size. If they're too big, the gas flows through without any separation. If they're too small, the gas gets in there and condenses on the surface, won't go through. So the, you talk about obstacles. But if a suitable barrier could be manufactured, it promised a greater yield than the electromagnetic process. Both techniques would have to be done on a massive scale and would prove extremely costly. And if they worked, they would provide fuel for a bomb that would be designed in a remote area of New Mexico. Grove selected a bomb design site in Los Alamos, an isolated location in the mountains at an elevation of 7,000 feet and accessible by only one road. General Groves wanted it to be inland, uh, too far for enemy planes or submarines. He wanted it to be beautiful, where he said he could keep a bunch of prima donnas amused. In November of 1942, the Army purchased 54,000 acres for $440,000 under the guise of using them as a demolition range. To head up the installation, Groves, an expert judge of men, chose a most unlikely candidate, J. Robert Oppenheimer. A gifted physics professor, Oppenheimer had a reputation for being temperamental, perhaps not suited to a highly stressful assignment. It was advised that Oppenheimer would be a disaster. Uh, people told him that Oppenheimer couldn't run a hot dog stand. Oppenheimer was a fascinating and complicated man. Fundamentally, he seems to have had some of the qualities of an actor. He was different things to different people. Oppenheimer drew luminaries like Enrico Fermi, Hans Bethe, and Edward Teller to the facility, as well as technicians fresh out of college. Laboratory personnel grew from 250 in 1943 to 2,500 in 1945. There were lots of babies born. General Groves at one point asked Oppenheimer if he couldn't do something about that, and he said he didn't think so. The one place that they had to keep expanding was the maternity ward at the hospital. During the fall of 1942, the theoretical physicists at Los Alamos began the difficult process of trying to determine how much U-235 it would take to make a bomb. And the scientists tell him, well, it could be uh, X amount, but uh, that's a plus or minus uh, by a factor of 10. Uh, Groves is, is absolutely staggered. He uses the illustration that, um, well, you're giving a wedding, and um, uh, you, you say it's for 100 people, but maybe 1,000 will turn up, or maybe 10. So uh, how can you make any sort of plans uh, with that range? This kind of uncertainty only served to fuel fears that the Nazis might be closer to building a bomb. In early fall of 1942, General Groves purchased 59,000 acres in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. This would become the main site for uranium production in the United States. The Manhattan Project will return on Modern Marvels. On December 28, 1942, 
President Roosevelt approved an additional $500 million investment in the Manhattan Project. The first priority, to build the massive industrial facilities that would produce the fissionable material to fuel the atom bomb. Robert Oppenheimer's team of physicists doubled the amount of uranium-235 thought necessary to achieve critical mass and sustain an explosive chain reaction to 200 kilograms. Their calculation, made without adequate samples of U-235 for tests, would prove to be 10 times the required amount. The scientists at Los Alamos also studied tampers, barrier materials that would slow the expansion of the critical mass and reflect neutrons back to feed the fission process inside the bomb. Determined to have the atom bomb ready for use in the war, General Groves notified contractors in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, that they had a scant six months to build the massive electromagnetic calutrons designed by Ernest Lawrence at the University of California in Berkeley. These calutrons would be used to separate U-235 from U-238. Lawrence was, to some extent, an engineer. He was comfortable with the soldering iron and with wrenches and with uh, the tools of the trade, uh, with building machines. In February 1943, construction began on the Calutron site that was given the deliberately nondescript code name, Y-12. These gigantic structures contained multiple Calutrons, box-shaped collection units that were configured in a racetrack layout. A magnetic field passed throughout the entire oval of calutrons, causing the divergence of streams of U-235 and U-238 so that the separated isotopes could be collected. A single calutron could capture a mere 10 grams of U-235 daily. A staggering total of 1,152 would be built by war's end. Because of the intense time constraints, Groves could not afford to build pilot plants facilities to test the scaling up of the laboratory processes. They're physically building Oak Ridge and Y-12, the electro electromagnetic separation plant, uh, before the design drawings had even been approved. And it's incredible that you would never do this in civilian life, and you would never do it short of a wartime emergency that is dire. They turn the, the Alpha-1 racetrack on to make the, the first uranium, and everything goes haywire. That uh, the magnets are so strong that they pull uh, uh, nails out of the wall. Groves arrived and shut the plant down. His response was characteristic of his approach. Since the racetracks were not operating to capacity, more would have to be built to supply the bombs. As a result, the town of Oak Ridge continued to grow to house an expanding workforce. 75,000 people would ultimately come to live at the site. Groves used creative means to recruit them. It was hard to get construction workers during the war. His solution was to put out ads saying, we can't tell you what you'll be doing, but there'll be steak every night on the table. Once hired, workers were instructed to be evasive about what they were doing. If anybody asks you what you make in Oak Ridge, you tell them you're making the, uh, the lights for the lightning bugs, or that you're making the um, uh, holes for the donuts. Ha <laughs> ha. Meanwhile, at Los Alamos, design work was underway on the gadget, as the test bomb came to be known. The main obstacle was how to quickly assemble two smaller subcritical masses into one larger explosive one. The bomb design that they came up with was a gun design. Inside the bomb, a cannon would fire one piece of radioactive fuel into another at 3,000 feet per second. The pieces would have to come together fast enough to prevent spontaneously emitted neutrons from melting the fuel, causing the bomb to fizzle rather than explode. But the engineering aspects were daunting. It's one thing to say you can shoot a piece of uranium at a second piece, but how do you do it? How fast does it have to go? How do you stop it at the end? How do you keep it together long enough as a mass so that it does go high order and give you an atomic bomb? Oppenheimer led the effort to overcome these obstacles by setting an example for his team at Los Alamos. In the middle of the night, something would be done. In would walk Robert just at the right time to see how it went. He was interested in everything, in the explosives, and the mechanics, and the chemistry, and the bomb itself, of course. 
And this is what makes a big laboratory of thousands of people working together go here. Oppenheimer was living on coffee and martinis and cigarettes. Groves was eating Whitman and chocolate samplers and sleeping soundly, whereas Oppenheimer was anguished. You know, they were, they were just so different. But they seemed to be able to mesh, and they certainly had a common goal. And this common goal was about to reach a new level. As scientists refined the design of the gadget, a new man-made element, plutonium, was gaining favor as a possible fuel. Identified in 1941, plutonium was almost twice as likely to undergo fission as uranium-235 and could be produced on a large scale by irradiating uranium in nuclear reactors. In order to produce plutonium, three production reactors were designed by engineers at the University of Chicago that would be built in Hanford, Washington. Groves initiated the construction at Hanford on August 27, 1943, with a labor force that had been recruited to the area. Numbers as high as 60,000 construction workers living in tents out on the Hanford Reservation. So the government went in and, and uh, bought up a half a million acres out in the desert of eastern Washington, created this remote construction site, and literally in a matter of months, constructed large-scale uh, engineered structures for plutonium production. But Groves was not content to rely on just two approaches, Y-12 and Hanford, to produce the weapons-grade fuel for the bomb. By September 1943, he had begun construction on a third, K-25, a gigantic gaseous diffusion plant at Oak Ridge. In the diffusion process, a gaseous compound, uranium hexafluoride, passes through a cascade of barriers, each one giving a slight enrichment of the lighter isotope U-235. The difficulty lay in finding a barrier that would not be degraded by the very corrosive gas. Scientists and engineers were not able to manufacture a satisfactory barrier until a year after site construction began on K-25 a building that would ultimately cover more area than any structure ever built. The U-shape measured half a mile long by a thousand feet wide. With an area of two million square feet, it contained a series of sealed containers and cascades that ran the length of the building. Oak Ridge continued to grow, and by the end of the war, it was the fifth largest town in Tennessee. The total power consumption during the K-25 operation during the war in the Manhattan District was about 10% of the electrical power, electrical energy in the United States. If you look at the size, the scope of the K-25 site in the Manhattan Project, uh, I don't think there's been any engineering feat to, to date comparable to what was done within the time frame. It was looking less and less likely that enough U-235 could be produced to impact the war. At the same time, the alternative, plutonium, was proving to be equally tricky. Impurities in this new element were leading to increased neutron activity that would cause bombs to pre-detonate, to fizzle before the two halves joined in a critical mass. There are production problems at Oak Ridge. They're not sure they can even make any uranium at that point, uranium-235. And so if they can't use plutonium in a gun, there may, in fact, not even be an atomic bomb. It's a real crisis. It's at that point that uh, I think Oppenheimer's talent comes to the fore, where he brings in the people, new people, in fact, and he reorganizes Los Alamos, but brings people in to solve the problem of how to make a plutonium bomb. The plutonium bomb's new configuration called for an outer shell of explosives that would direct symmetrical shockwaves inward compressing a subcritical central mass of plutonium. The resulting increase in the density would shrink distances between nuclei, thus starting the explosive chain reaction. Nobody had ever taken high explosives, wrapped them around something, and got a symmetrical, symmetrical explosion. And so they weren't even sure they could do that technically. It was a very, very tough engineering problem. So from May 1944 until about August of 44, the laboratory wrestles with this problem. By late 1944, K-25, the gaseous diffusion plant, was producing enriched U-235 that ran through the magnetic calutrons to effect a further enrichment. 
This one-two punch generated enough fuel for one gun-type bomb. But if, as military strategists thought, it would take more than one bomb to break the enemy's will, then it was crucial that the upcoming test of the new plutonium implosion bomb work. All this uncertainty only served to heighten tensions at Los Alamos, as scientists and engineers prepared for the first detonation of an atomic weapon. If the implosion design was successful, it might bring an end to the war. As a substitute for copper, which was in short supply during World War II, the U.S. Army borrowed almost 15,000 tons of silver from the U.S. Treasury to wind into coils for the Calutron's electromagnets. The Manhattan Project will return on Modern Marvels. Weapon design for the uranium gun bomb was completed by February 1945. Confidence in the weapon was high. They named it Little Boy for its relatively small size, 10 feet long and less than 10,000 pounds. Designers considered a test prior to combat use unnecessary and impossible since there was only enough U-235 for one bomb. The design for the more complicated plutonium-fueled implosion device dubbed Fat Man for its rotund shape was approved in March, and a test was scheduled for July. In preparation for deployment of the weapons, Colonel Paul Tibbets, a veteran combat pilot with extensive B-29 experience, was selected and placed at the head of a new unit, the 509th Composite Group. The unit began training at Wendover Field, Utah, dropping 5,500-pound orange dummy bombs. On April 12, 1945, President Roosevelt died in Warm Springs, Georgia, bringing Vice President Harry S. Truman into the Oval Office. Secrecy on the Manhattan Project had been so tight that Truman was not privy to the bomb developments and had to be briefed extensively in his first weeks in office. Less than one month later, German armed forces in Europe surrendered. But Japan did not. In June 1945, Tibbets and his unit moved to Tinian Island in the Pacific, 1,450 miles from Tokyo, where the Navy Seabees had built the world's largest airport to accommodate Boeing's new B-29 super fortresses. The island was selected because it was within striking range of Japan. Number two, it had the longest runways. Number three, it had the facilities there to modify the area where we're gonna load the bomb. I wanted to have my crews fly over enemy territory because they were not used to flying over enemy territory. I wanted to get practice flying, being shot at, flying alone. Half a world away on the morning of July 16, 1945, in the New Mexico desert, 200 miles south of Los Alamos, scientists and dignitaries awaited the results of the first test of an atomic weapon. Oppenheimer had given the test of the implosion device the code name Trinity, a reference to a devotional poem by 17th century English poet John Donne. The poem explores the paradox of a god that destroys in order to renew. But on the morning of the Trinity test, the implosion device did not look particularly imposing atop a tower 100 feet high. One of the guys said that um, really the Trinity device owes a tremendous debt to 3M because uh, most of it was held together with masking tape. It was a garage bomb, basically. And it literally takes about three days to assemble one of these wartime devices. Think of them as crude laboratory devices. They're not production designs. You don't roll them off an assembly line. You've got to worry about, have we done everything right? What's missing? And there are stories where people at last minute have a nightmare that they put something together wrong, actually go back in and discover that, oh, I inserted this wire backwards or that one. The scientists waited anxiously at their posts. Some feared success because of speculation that the bomb might ignite the atmosphere and destroy the world. Teller was about was 20 miles away at Campania Hill with Lawrence. And um, Teller mostly scared everybody to death because uh, he was putting suntan lotion on his face. 
and uh, in his in his hands and, and as a guard against the uh, ultraviolet from the bomb. And this is 20 miles away. All the scientists were 20 miles away, but most feared a dud, especially since a blank test of the explosives surrounding the core had failed just days before. Sensors showed that they had not fired simultaneously and would not have compressed the core properly. It was really unnerving when the blank shot failed. The normal anxiety that one might have had uh, with a device on which you had worked but had never been tested fully uh, was heightened by, the, by the, uh, the, the failure of the blank shot. General Groves was lying on the ground in the prone position facing away from the blast. What he said was going through his mind was, what was he going to do when the timer got to zero and nothing happened? At 5.30 AM, July 16, 1945, the world entered the atomic age with an intense flash, a sudden wave of heat, followed by a tremendous shock wave. The ball of fire extended 40,000 feet. The bomb packed a punch equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT, the high end of most of the scientists' predictions, completely vaporizing the steel tower and heating the desert sand into glass for a radius of 800 yards. What caught me was, I hadn't thought, the heat of the fireball would heat my face exactly as it's sun. It became brighter and brighter and rose, and I knew that soon it will be used over, over Japan, and then it will not be just an experiment. Groves returned to Washington to report the results to Secretary of War Henry Stimson and to make preparations for the use of the bomb against Japan. Later that day, Groves had his photograph taken for the publicity that would accompany the bombing of Hiroshima. I said, the general looked down right there at Tokyo. He put his hands on his hips and says, no, I won't look at Tokyo, Ed, but I'll look somewhere close to it. So he did, and I made the picture. I don't know wherever he was looking was probably Hiroshima. Although Trinity had been a success, questions remained about Fat Man. The gadget at Trinity was not a bomb. Couldn't have been dropped. <laughs> It was a gadget sitting on top of a tower. So could the bomb work? Uh, that would certainly have been the military view as we, we test them in action. Moreover, the untested little boy would only get one chance to work. The only way we could know for sure is if we actually test it, but we don't have enough uranium. So we're gonna have to look at this and say, our calculations look good, our engineering looks good, but we don't know. And so Little Boy goes into combat as an untested weapon. The course of the war, the work of thousands, the expenditure of billions, and the fate of more than 100,000 Japanese soldiers and civilians hung in the balance on the morning of August 6, 1945, as the Enola Gay flew 31,000 feet over Hiroshima. On its way home from delivering the uranium bomb to Tinian Island, the USS Indianapolis was torpedoed and sunk by a Japanese submarine. Of the 1,196 men aboard, only 315 were saved. The Manhattan Project will return on Modern Marvels. In June of 1945, 155 Manhattan Project scientists signed a petition calling for a demonstration of the atomic bomb over an uninhabited area prior to its use against Japan. General Groves heard about the petition and ordered that it not be circulated at Los Alamos. Then, to undermine the petition, he conducted a poll of atomic scientists. What do you think of a demonstration? To his chagrin, 83% of the people answering the poll said some sort of demonstration was preferable to bombing civilians. So then Grove saw to it that the petition was bottled up at Oak Ridge until after the bombs fell on Japan. There was, however, strong support, 
particularly at the highest levels of government and the military, to use the bombs swiftly against Japanese cities. There was every incentive to use this weapon to scare the Japanese into surrender before the Russians got in on the post-war settlement. What our military leaders feared was what happened in Korea, where there was a North Japan and a South Japan, and the North Japan was communist and the South Japan was capitalist. Moreover, the assault on the Japanese mainland, scheduled for November of 1945, would include a million and a half Allied soldiers. Casualties in the Pacific indicated that losses would be heavy. By the end of the Second World War, we were so angry at the Japanese. They had started the war, they had fought furiously and brutally. They had slaughtered civilians. We had, by that time, totally destroyed their air force. We had totally destroyed their navy, and yet they wouldn't surrender. In the spring of 1945, General Groves chose populated Japanese cities as potential targets to demonstrate the bomb's destructive power and end the war as quickly as possible. Once selected, the cities on his short list were off limits to Allied bombing raids. They would be saved in order to be destroyed. The final decision rested with the president and was made on June 1st after a conversation with his Secretary of State, James Burns. And at one point, Burns said to Truman, Mr. President, what will you tell the American people at your impeachment in 1946 when they find out that you had a weapon that could have ended the war and saved American lives and you decided not to use it? I think that probably was the decisive argument for Truman. He'd been in World War I, and he knew what it was to fight and die. And I think he was interested in stopping it as quick as he could. And I certainly admired the man for what he did. Let there be no mistake. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a reign of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. At 2.45 a.m. on August 6th, Paul Tibbetts lifted the Enola Gay off the runway on Tinian Island. I thought the airplane will probably go down in history. And I wanted to be sure that, in my mind, there could be no other B-29 that would have the same name. Well, my mother's name, Enola Gay, fit the bill because I knew there could not be two Enola Gays. On August 6th, 1945, at 8.15 a.m., the gun model uranium bomb, Little Boy, dropped from bomb bay doors of the Enola Gay. 43 seconds later, the bomb detonated 1,900 feet above Hiroshima with a force of 12,500 tons of TNT. I could see little bits of Hiroshima down there, but I couldn't, there was nothing there but black boiling mess. And steam was coming up, there were bubbles, and that's the way that thing looked. Ninety percent of the city was leveled by the 500-mile-an-hour winds of the blast, which charred victims' skin two miles away and incinerated those directly beneath the detonation. We visited the uh, patients. We visited the railroad platform, which they had lined up all the people who were dying of radiation sickness, maybe six or 800, nothing to be done. They didn't have anything to go work with. The small boy, I think it was a boy, was bloated and you know, he couldn't hardly recognize the face at all. He said, Okacha, Okacha, Mizu, Mizu, Mommy, Mommy, water, water. The pitiful, painful cry is something I'll never forget. The Japanese death toll rose to 130,000 people killed by the blast and ensuing radiation sickness. Three days later, a second, more powerful plutonium bomb, Fat Man, fell on Nagasaki with similar results. Japan surrendered on August 14, 1945. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world and that God will preserve it 
always. The most catastrophic war in human history was over. I figured out how many of us at Los Alamos really knew all that was going on. And dividing that into the number of casualties, I figure that I'm responsible for 100 or 200 of them. And that's a hard kind of thing to be responsible for. But um, uh, I've been asked, in view of that calculation, would I do it again? And the answer is yes, because any new weapon uh, I would want to be given first to the United States. The American atomic weapon monopoly was short-lived. In 1949, the Soviets detonated an atomic bomb. During the 1950s, both superpowers added the hydrogen bomb to their arsenals in an attempt to achieve military superiority. Ultimately, the two would have tens of thousands of weapons in their nuclear arsenals. Progress cannot be stopped. And we are told to stop progress. I am very much afraid that progress will occur and will occur in a country that is less dedicated to peace than we are. But Oppenheimer did not agree that the arms race represented progress. His opposition to Edward Teller's hydrogen bomb project and questions about his communist sympathies led to the revoking of his security clearance at a government hearing in 1954. Teller testified against his former chief. He should not have testified against Oppenheimer. I think that the whole proceeding against Oppenheimer was a terrible mistake on the part of the United States government. And I, I, I felt very upset by it, as I think many scientists did. And I felt that any scientist who supported this was more or less uh, doing exactly the wrong thing. Oppenheimer's career had been brought to an end. But the debate over his and the Manhattan Project's contribution to history was just beginning. If you graph human deaths from war across the last 200 years, you will see an exponential increase up to 1945, at which point the line on the graph drops to about a million a year and stays there for the rest of the century. Clearly, there was a radical break in international affairs in 1945. And I think that break has to be attributed to this discovery that scientists made, working peacefully in their laboratories, trying to understand how the world really works, rather than how we would wish that it worked. The question of the Manhattan Project's legacy whether the atom bomb produced under the strain of war by some of the greatest scientific minds of the last century should be seen paradoxically as a peacemaker or simply as a savage destructive weapon remains as polarizing today as it was 50 years ago. But for some, this debate is not abstract. The legacy of August 6, 1945 is far too personal. Every year on this day, on day 15, I always offer prayer, and it, even this morning, tears flow. I, I just couldn't, and everything comes right back at me. And of course, I can't forget all the people that was killed in that bomb. But perhaps the most lasting effect of the Manhattan Project. I can't recall an event that had such a decisive effect on American society or all societies because for the first time they faced instant, total, absolute annihilation and one for which the average citizen had no material way to intervene to prevent it. It shattered this, this sense of security and of, uh, of confidence in American society, I think unlike any other event in, in our history. 